Hey brothers and sisters, this is Francis just bringing a word today. I just finished about a 30 minute video and um, when I went to hit share, normally it pulls up a little YouTube icon and I click on that and it downloads it to YouTube. Well, the YouTube icon isn't there anymore. And uh, I'm pretty sure I saw it glitch, so I'm sure the uh, voice and the video were off. i got to figure that out. So um, I wanted to bring a word today. I had a guy uh, contact me and he was all upset because I had the word, the words rapture ready in my uh, title. And um, I told him, you know, he said, you know, it's just a bait and switch, just a bait and switch. And I told him, I said, uh, you know, I do discuss the rapture. I got a word from the Lord about the rapture. He told me uh, clearly in his word. He showed me again, he confirmed it, he showed me again, he confirmed it again, and again, and again, and then he told me the year. And I sent him to the videos, I said, go look, watch these videos and you'll see. But I just explained to him, I said, look, you know, my title is not deceptive. It says rapture ready. You know, when God gave me the year 5777, he told me straight out in my ear, okay, I was a loud audible voice, but then in my spirit, he said, it's enough to know the year. Now go and do what you need to do, which I knew was to prepare the body of Christ. You know, I mean, let me ask, ask you like this. Do you really need another dream uh, to watch another dream? And, and God bless the, the people that are having dreams and the visions. I, I, I watch them too, you know. I'm careful who I watch. I'm, I'm very careful. But there's some people that I follow and, and I love their stuff. It's, it's encouraging. But I don't need to hear another word or dream to know that the rapture is coming. I know it's coming. I know it's coming. What God is pressing upon me is get your heart ready for the rapture. And what God told me was that was going to be my ministry. My ministry was getting people ready. There's a lot of believers out there that are watching. You know, Jesus said, watch and pray always. You know, we're watching. You know, in Revelations, he said, if you do not watch... I'll come like a thief in the night, and you won't know what hour I come. Well, that's true, because if we do watch, it's not like a thief in the night. And you know, that's a Jewish idiom. It doesn't mean a thief coming at night. It means the temple guard coming, finding the, the temple guards asleep and lighting their clothes on fire. He says, if you, if you, uh, so if we do watch, we're not going to be asleep like the temple guards, and we will know what hour he comes. See, we're supposed to know. We're supposed to know. He said, to you has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to everybody else, all things come in parables. He spoke in parables to hide things from the devil. You know, one of the reasons why I don't think it's been narrowed down to a day or a time is I don't think um, he wants the devil to know. I don't think he wants the devil to know. I think that's why I think, you know, having a season is more than enough for us. You know, the thing about it is I trust my father. I had to get to a place of complete trust where I just trust my father. So my ministry is all about getting the hearts of the people ready to, to see Jesus, ready to meet their king, you know, and that's what this is all about. So I just wanted to say that, um, that, anywho, um, well, I got a, um, I got a message from a woman yesterday. I gave a testimony of my marriage, um, and you know. It was a really difficult time, but hey, I made it through it, yay. <laughs> and uh, uh, she was telling me that she prayed for something and it, she didn't see it. And then when she didn't see it, she said, um, so it didn't happen. And what I wanted to come on here today, what God in my spirit, because this wasn't what I was going to teach today. I had something else entirely in mind. I wanted to remind you to watch your confession. See, remember I told you, in a loud audible voice and y'all got to understand the stuff that I'm teaching the stuff that I'm bringing you is not anything in my opinion if I have an opinion I'm gonna say hey you know what guys this is my opinion otherwise I'm telling you either I got a direct word from the Lord I got a vision from the Lord um, I had a dream from the Lord or I went through a trial where he revealed himself to me and how it was gonna work out you know I mean that was you know you're witnessing it you know, you're there, you're the witness, you know, like those people that witnessed Jesus after the crucifixion, they were there with him. All right. Nobody can take that away from them. Nobody can say that didn't happen. Nobody can say Jesus didn't raise from the dead. They were there. They saw it. So it's kind of like that. 
all right? So he said the power that the devil has is the power we give him by the words that we speak. I cannot on one side of my mouth pray over something and, and believe that they're healed and then when I don't see it say, well, I guess they didn't get healed. I just contradicted what I did and it nullifies it in the spirit. Remember I told you this story about Daniel in Daniel 10 when he, he prayed about that thing and 21 days, later, 21 days later the angel came and Daniel was like, what took you so long? He said, from the moment you spoke, Daniel, God sent me. But the prince of Persia put up battle and, and I was held up in heaven for 21 days. But because of your word, which meant because you didn't doubt, because you kept confessing and believing, da Daniel didn't waver in his faith. See, then Michael was sent on his behalf and then he broke free. And I want to tell y'all, it's like that with us. You've got to understand that just because you don't see the thing you prayed for right away doesn't mean it didn't happen. You know, that's the whole purpose of that story of Thomas that I gave. There's a spirit realm going on. There's battles between angels and demons. You know, the, the, so, the Bible says the sower sows the word. We sow the word. Then the word, you know, and it says in Isaiah 55, my word shall not return to me void, but shall accomplish what it was sent to do. You know, he, let, let me tell you something. There's a, there's a, there's a word, and I don't remember the, 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 uh, the exact, um, where it is in the Bible. You have to look it up. But it's a, it's a psalm, I believe. It's in Psalms. And you can just look it up. Just Google it. He says, I shall uphold my word even above my own name. See, God... The Word of God, he holds in, in such high esteem that it's, he even holds it above his own name. All right? It's his responsibility to do his word. God's not a man that he should lie. If you find it in the Word and you stand on it, it's God is obligated to do that thing. He is obligated to do it. I mean, that, that's what I love about this thing. But we got to be able to stand in faith. What does the Bible say about a man who doubts? Is a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. And then he says... Let that man expect nothing from God. So I want to encourage you, just because you don't see something you prayed about doesn't mean it didn't happen. All right, let me, let me, let me explain it like this, and let me explain it another way. Jesus is, is riding with his friends, and he comes across a fig tree, and he reaches up to get a fig, but there's no figs on it, and he cursed the tree. The tree didn't die. It's just sitting there, looking the same. They went on to the town. The next day, the Bible says, the next day they came back the same way and the tree was dead. And Peter commented, wow, even the trees are subject to him. Well, why did it not die right away? Because the word, the curse that he spoke out of his mouth had to go down and kill the root. And it took time. There's, 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 a, there's a word in Genesis that says, as long as the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest will not pass away. And what God showed me brilliantly one time was the word is connected seed time and he separated the word time from seed so I saw seed time and harvest there's always a period of time between the word that you sow and the harvest that you reap what is it what's well, God's time you know there's there's an old cliche I don't like cliches you know, I let go, let God. I hate cliches. I hate them. Don't ever comment to me with cliches. But there's one that is really good that I like. God is never early. He's never late. He's always right on time. And he is. He is. He's always right on time. Our time is different. You know, we're in a hurry. We're impatient. He's not. He sees the beginning from the end. He knows what's going on. If we trust in him, if we have faith in him, you know, what does the Bible say about faith? It's the only way to please God. It's the only way to please God. How? By faith. What, am I, what do I have faith in? I have faith in his word. He exalts his word above his own name. So if, that's, if it's that important to him, if it's more important than even his own name, then I want to make his word that important. I want to make that thing that important. If God said it, by gosh, I believe it. I believe it. I'm going to stand on that thing and I'm going to believe it. And you know what? However long it takes, I don't care. That's not my job. My job, Jesus said, the sower sows the word. He said, when, when he finished giving the parable of the sowers, and I've talked about this before, they looked at him, they were confused. They were like, the, it's, well, the Bible says, and those with Jesus and the 70, okay, they came to Jesus and they said, what was the meaning of that parable? And he looked at him and he said, do you not understand this parable? 
how then will you understand all the parables? In other words, if you don't get this, you're not going to understand anything. Well, how important is the sower? It's the most important parable of all. It is the beginning of wisdom. It is the beginning of revelation. It is the beginning of knowledge. If you get the sower sows the word, everything else would begin to make sense to you. The revelations, the wisdom of God will be poured out upon you because you have to understand what's going on in the sower. All right? He... He explains it. and Go read the sower and meditate on it, people. Meditate on it. First he tells the parable, then he explains the parable. But if you go a little bit farther, then it, he talks about a farmer. Now see, it's not a separate teaching. He didn't break and go off somewhere else and start teaching. It's part of the same teaching of the sower. He said, it's like a farmer who scatters seed. And he does not, he goes to sleep by night and he rises by day and he doesn't worry about what the seed's doing. See, you gotta understand, the farmer didn't go to sleep at night and go, oh, well, what if that seed doesn't plant? What if the plant doesn't grow? He doesn't do that. Why? Because the farmer knows if he's taking care of his soil, if he's tilled his soil, and he's got fertilizer in the soil, and he's got all the rocks out, and he's got all the weeds out, and that soil is just like beautiful and awesome and fertile and, and tender and ready for seed, and then he plants the seed, he knows if it's got sun and it's got water, what's it going to do? It's going to grow. He also knows if he plants cabbage, he's not going to get oranges. Orange trees are not coming up. He's going to get exactly what he planted. And this is what Jesus is trying to tell us. The sower sows the word of God. You know, people ask me to pray for him. And I tell them all the time, give me some information. You know, pray for my sister. What's going on with her? You know, I can't sow a seed of, of deliverance if she's dealing with something else. Okay? It's like I told you. It's like archery. If I'm going and, and, and I don't bow hunt. But I used to target shoot. But if you went bow hunting, you couldn't just start launching arrows all over the place. You have to aim at your target. Well, the sower sows the word is implying what, what is happening. Remember, remember when Jesus was, was, went to the desert and it says, and Satan came to him three times? And what did Jesus do? He said, it is written. And then whatever the attack was, Jesus quoted the word that dealt specifically with the attack. And that's the message of the sower. Find the word that deals with your situation and speak it out of your mouth. Sow it like a seed. But remember, there's time. Look, if you plant... I planted some orange trees in my backyard. And they didn't start producing oranges for five years. They didn't come... As soon as that tree came up, and the tree came up to the size where it could produce fruit. It didn't produce fruit because it took a, it took a couple years for it to mature. Then it started producing oranges. That's the way it is with the word. Sometimes it's going to happen right away and sometimes it's going to take time, seed, time, and harvest. So I want to encourage you all, just because you don't see your answer doesn't mean it's not coming. And I told you before, when you see your miracle, that's not when you got your miracle. It's not when you saw it. It's when you found it in the Word, you spoke it out of your mouth, and you stood on it in faith. That's the day you got your miracle. And I want to encourage you, watch your confession. Faith's confession is critical, y'all. It's just critical. You've got to watch the words that are coming out of your mouth. You can't pray about something one way and then turn around and talk about it like it didn't happen or God's not going to do it in the other. You've got to continue to speak about it in faith. The Bible says we speak of these things that be not as though they be. In other words, talk about them the way you want them to be. You prayed about th that thing, start speaking about it like it's already happened. Just start confessing it. You, you know, I, I like to think about it like this. I'm putting God on the spot. He promised me that his word would not return to him void. He said, I uphold my word even above my own name. Okay, Father, I'm just expecting it then. I'll, I'll, I'll start talking about it like it's already come to pass. And I want to warn you. I want to warn you. And some of you people will know what I'm talking about. Watch what happens when no one's around and you start talking to yourself. Does anybody talk to themselves? And there's a situation that you're going through. Maybe there is somebody you're dealing with. Maybe something's going on in your life. Have you ever caught yourself talking about that situation? You know, the Bible says, don't talk about your situation. He says, what do we say to these things? 
If God is for me, who can be against me? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? We're not supposed to talk about our situation. We're supposed to speak to it. What does he mean? We're supposed to speak about it, to it. What does a word say about it? I've prayed about that thing. I've sown the word to it. Now I'm talking to it like it's already happened. And it will spring forth. So I want to encourage y'all. I want to encourage y'all. Watch your words. Watch your faith's confession. And get out there and lay hands on people. Cast out demons. Perform miracles. And write me and tell me what they are. First of all, they'll start happening in your life. Then they'll start happening in other people's lives around you. And start teaching also. Don't hoard this thing. This is not for just us. This is for the body of Christ. This is for everybody. Teach these principles. Teach these principles. Walk in the Spirit. All right, you know I love y'all. And uh, this was actually kind of a short video. The last one I did was 30 minutes. I must have put more in there. Maybe I condense it the second time. You know, maybe I first time was just to get it all out, gather my thoughts, and then, you know, streamline it the second time. So I wanted to give you a little story about um, my son. Uh, remember, I told you when uh, yesterday I gave that testimony, my wife was pregnant. Well, the child that she birthed was my middle child. I love my middle child. He is awesome. I love you, Francisco. When you see this, I want you to know I love you. My son is brilliant. He's He's a he's an absolute genius. He's like one of the smartest persons I know. He should be um, uh, down on Wall Street, some big wig attorney somewhere for some huge firm. But that's not the path that he chose. He chose a different path. I guess he wants to be an entrepreneur. I don't know. But he's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. He uh, he scored an 1800 on his SATs in his junior year without even studying. I mean, this kid never cracked a book in his life. And he just you know, it's just remarkable. It, I was. Yeah, Je Francisco, I'm a little jealous of you. Let's I'll admit it. He's so smart. And he's handsome and he's athletic. I remember he I kept trying to get him to go out for the football team. So we went to this high school and, and he went out for the for the football team and he, he made the team as the quarterback. And the first game he threw like seven touchdown passes and, and ran for a gazillion yards and they won the game. He was the big hero. And then he got in trouble and got kicked out of school. So you know, but he just, you know, he, he wanted to be a gymnast and he taught himself how to tumble you know he, he just taught himself how to tumble and then and then he wanted to take up diving and he was diving with the team in no time you know and, the, and everybody just scratches their head he can do anything he puts his mind to he decided he wanted to learn Spanish so he learned Spanish in two weeks and he speaks fluently with perfect dialect now he's probably uh, learning Portuguese I don't know who knows he can learn anything he wants he's absolutely brilliant so one day uh, oh well you know anyways but but about his history he was, he was, um, I know kids. I ran 22 daycares and karate schools. And the karate schools, after, after, um, the Little Dragons came out, or I mean, not Little Dragons, after Ninja Turtles came out and, uh, Karate Kid came out, all the adults left. When all the kids came flooding in, the kids ran off the adults. Martial arts used to be all adults. It was great. It was moms and dads coming in for a workout. They were serious. They were dedicated. It was fun, you know. And then all the kids came in. It was like, whoa! I had to get, I had to get educated on kids, you know. And, and when you run a daycare, you have to have certain amount of hours of child development and stuff like that. So I, my wife and I were constantly going in, getting retrained and doing stuff. So we, we have all kinds of experience with kids. I've got 35 years of, almost 40 years of teaching kids now and all this training and um i know kids and i'm good with kids i know all different kinds of kids too my son my middle child was the most difficult child i've ever ever had in my life he was so difficult i mean he he was just different you know he thought on a different level but he was so much smarter than everybody else i think he was just bored i think he was so smart he was just bored with everything so um so he was uh he was a handful and when he was you know two I think he was two and a half at this time he was running around the karate school I'm teaching my wife was managing the front desk at the time uh, and she was you know she helped me teach but at the same time you know if parents would come in or the phone would ring or whatever she had to deal with money or issues of payment or 
quality control, whatever. She managed that part of it, and I and I and I managed mainly the the, the teaching of the classes. So my son, my two and a half year old son, is running. He's constantly running around the business, which is great. You know, I could I my kids grew up in my business. They were with me all the time. It was awesome. You know, I raised my kids. They nobody else raised them. It was really cool. So, but he was a handful. He was not a normal child. He he had to be like my oldest son. You could give him you could give him a Hot Wheel or a Matchbox car, put him in the corner, and six hours later you have to tell him, come on, Joe, come on, Joe, let's go, come on, come on, come on, let's go. Never even know he was there. He could entertain himself, but now Francisco, he had to be entertained. He had to constantly be entertained. So I'm having to watch this two and a half year old and teach karate classes at the same time. And my school was big back then, 30, 35, 38 people in class, which is big for martial arts school, you know. And um, this one day uh, I noticed. Uh, I was teaching the first class and I looked over, I just started teaching and he had fallen asleep on these mats. And I thought, whoa, yeah, cool, great, I'll get a break, you know, I can just teach. And when that class ended at six, I looked over, I know, because they, they're back to back, five to six, six to seven, seven to eight. I looked at him and he was still sleeping. I was like, oh yeah, because normally, you know, a little kid, he take a 20, 30 minute nap and then he's up and about again. So this was about an hour nap and he's still sleeping. I thought, wow, yes, all right. So uh, the, uh, six to seven o'clock class ends and I look over and he's still sleeping. I thought, that's really odd. But hey, I'm not gonna look gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> Maybe he just was up all night or you know, something, I don't know. And I started the second class or the third class, seven o'clock and I did I do like 10 minutes of warm up and then I break everybody give them a chance of water and then we're going to start the middle part of class like it's real intense like a really hard workout and I just felt something in my spirit say something's not right go feel your son so I went over there and I was like I rubbed, you know kind of moved hey Francisco nothing like Francisco Francisco nothing he was out and then I felt him he was burning up I picked him up ran him to the front and and I didn't have anybody there to teach for me it was a beginner night I had you know 35 people in class I couldn't leave but I gave Angela take him to the hospital take him to the hospital we ran him outside put him in the car strapped him in she zipped out of there she calls me up from the hospital and she says he's got a hundred and five temperature they're going to life light him to Texas Children's Hospital um they think he's got they think he's got a uh, a uh, 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 what Men, uh, meningitis he's dying 105 you're dying you know and she was distraught what do we do what do we do well we pray we pray right now we're gonna pray and we just took authority over that thing and we prayed and then I told her because we were young believers we were real young and I said call Jim you know the pastor guy the guy the guy that was our pastor at the time and he just miracles abounded by him I mean he was just a miracle I was like call Jim this is his phone number call him right now so we hung up she calls Jim and she comes home with our son about 30 minutes later and I said what happened she goes, you won't believe it. And I'm thinking, yes, I will. What happened? She goes, after I called you when we prayed, I called Jim and we prayed. She said, they, the, the helicopter came and they were um, wheeling him out. He was unconscious. His temperature was 105. We we're going to Texas Children, Te Texas Children Hospital in Houston, Texas, like the premier children's hospital. And, um, she said, We're we they're wheeling him out on, on the, the um stretcher, you know, to the to the uh helicopter, and all of a sudden he sits up and he started playing with the doctor's stethoscope. So blah, 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 talking into it, and the doctor's like, Whoa, 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 whoa. And and he put his hand on his head and he was like, Stop, hold on, nurse, go get me a thermometer. And she gets him a ther thermometer, she takes his temperature, perfect. 90 98.7 or 97.8, whatever it is, 98.7, 98.6, whatever the temperature is supposed to be perfect, that's what it was. And then he's like, no, 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 this ain't right, because they just took it. Before they left the building, they just took it, and it's, you know, 100 feet later, and, and now he's sitting up talking, you know? And uh, she, he says, go get me another one. They took it again. Go get me another one. They took it again. He said, turn the helicopter off. He's fine. And they took him back in. They, they ran a couple of tests and sent him home. They sent him home. And he's alive. And and Satan tried to take him out again a couple more times, actually. But he's still alive, and he's doing great. He's awesome, you know? He's he's just awesome. So I love my lo I love my son. Francisco, I love you. I know it was a rocky teenhood for you. And, and you know, and, and, you know, and we had our share of battles. But it's all good. 
It's all good. It's all good. I love you, Bear. Talk to you later. And I'll say goodbye to everybody. Bye, y'all.